So if we can form our young people in community, faith, and scholarship, and send them out to their communities, into their parishes, to their workplaces, they can truly transform culture in America, and, and that's what it's all about. Stephen Minnis is the president of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. Since his presidency in 2004, the college has experienced unprecedented growth, doubling enrollment, dozens of new buildings and programs, and recognition as one of America's best Catholic colleges. Listen in as we discuss his leadership philosophy, the deep roots and tradition of the college, and the hope to form students in community, faith, and scholarship to become great Catholic leaders in every walk of life. Benedictine College is transforming culture in America, one conversation at a time. From our studios in Atchison, Kansas, these are the Benedictine Dialogues. All right. Well, President Minnis, welcome to the Benedictine Dialogue. Well, thank you. Yeah, Appreciate you. Wonderful Jared. to have you yeah. here. It's great to be here. So in just a couple of weeks, we've got all of our students coming back to campus, and there's so much going on during the weeks leading up to that. What are some of the highlights you, you really look forward to? Well, just having our students back on campus is pretty amazing, and we'll have a record enrollment once again uh, this year. Uh, but, you know, it's I, I always look at it as a kind of a, a bigger picture. OK, mm -hmm. uh, we've been really blessed here at the college. You, you have to think, guys, we're founded all the way back in 1858. So think about that. That's three years before the Civil War uh, on the Kansas and Missouri border. People know their history. Not a great yes. place to start anything. Sure. OK, right. But the, but the monks were tough and wanted to start a school for the Lord's service here. And um to put like our longevity in perspective of Jared, of all the colleges and universities that were founded before the Civil War, 80% uh, of them don't exist anymore. Wow. Right. So wow. they've closed their doors for one reason or another. And of the 250 Catholic universities in America, there's only about 17 as old as we are. So wow. we've really stood the test of time. But but it's really Im important to think about that history, too, because this is a school. Benedictine College is a school that has survived the Civil War and two pandemics and the Great Depression and mm -hmm. two world wars, the civil unrest of the uh, 1960s, the financial burdens of the 70s and 80s, when you basically went from most of your uh, workers, most of your employees were not getting paid because they were monks and sisters working for free, sure. right? Uh, to you know, most of your uh, most of your workers, most of your employees are uh, laypersons, and so then your financial model is completely turned upside mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, and uh, this is a school that has survived this. But we've been really blessed, uh, Jared, because the last few years, let's say the last 15 years or so, great things have tended to happen for us. So in the last 15 years, our enrollment has doubled. Uh, we'll welcome the largest freshman class, the largest uh, enrollment in our history. Um, we have built 14 new residence halls. We've built six new academic buildings. We've either built new or renovated every dorm room, every classroom, and every athletic facility on our campus. We started new programs, which are pretty unusual for small liberal arts Catholic colleges. I'll give you a couple of examples. Engineering, architecture, um, not very many Catholic universities in America have both engineering and architecture. And, and so these, these are really great programs for us. So people all the time will ask me, okay, what's the secret, right? <laughs> why, why all this success and why now? You hear stories all the time. Uh, the number uh, enrollment is decreasing. Mm -hmm. Schools are closing. Well, why not Benedictine College? Okay, in Atchison, Kansas. And our uh, people ask me that question all the time, Jeremy. My answer is pretty simple. Uh, we really looked at two things. Okay, and everything about these two things informs everything that we do. Number one, we embraced our mother, mm -hmm. and the second thing we did, we embraced our mission. Yeah. Okay, uh, when I say that we embraced our mother. Um, you know, I, what I mean by that is we decided to put the entire college into her hands. We consecrated the college to the Blessed Virgin Mary 10 years ago. Uh, we re-consecrated the college to her on the five-year anniversary. Uh, we actually literally had a thousand students circle the campus, okay, and they prayed a simultaneous rosary. When the rosary was done, uh, we gave them each Pope blessed miraculous medals that they then buried in the ground and her graces would surround the campus. So her and, and, and really give us a lot of blessings. 
That's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, what they're what they're taking part in is such a. I love the long tradition of the Benedictines and what we stand for. And when you come to campus, you you literally feel it. I mean, that was one of the things that really attracted me here is the depth of the faith life, the depth of the long tradition that you're participating in, and these students, you know, getting to just be formed in that is just such a beautiful thing. And one of the things I really love too is that the some of the miraculous medals are, are buried into the concrete yes. uh, itself. Right? <laughs> right. That's exactly right. We have little uh, little areas. Like along the concrete, you can see where those miraculous medals are buried. So, yeah, so we're, uh, it, it's a constant reminder. And so when we decided to do this, you know, I, I then began asking myself, how can we put this into action? How can we put this consecration into action? So several things that we did. N- number one was <clears throat> this consecration happened about the time I was just fortunate enough a Jared to be invited as one of only five Catholic college presidents to be part of the church in America, uh, Vatican uh, inspired uh, group that met in, first in Rome in 2012 and then in Mexico City in 2013. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so in 2013, I know I was going to go to Mexico City. I know I was going to go to Our Lady Guadalupe. I was going to see the Telma. So I started reading up on on Our Lady Guadalupe. And and at one point in time, when she was appearing to St. Juan Diego, she said, there are many I could send, but you're the one I've chosen for this task. Mm. There are many I could send, but you are the one I've chosen for this task. And so that, that has been on my heart. And so when I came back from that, we consecrated the college to her. I then decided I was gonna put that into action. And so now, when a student uh, applies to Benedictine uh, I, and they are accepted, if they're accepted, I get their acceptance letter and I sign that letter. But before I do, I look at the name at the top of the letter. I say their name out loud. And as I sign my name, I pray a Hail Mary for that student, okay, specifically, that Mary will intercede on their behalf and bring them to Benedictine College. Uh, It's also, I tell the students why they can't read my handwriting, because I'm concentrating (laughs) on that prayer, right? You know, but anyway, um, and so I address the freshmen every year uh, at the beginning of the year. And uh, I'm, I tell them, I said, look, there are thousands of students just like you all across America. And they're sitting in chairs just like this. They're probably being addressed to them by their president as well. And each one of those students are saying, Oh, yeah, I picked this school. Oh, yeah, I chose this school. But at Benedictine College, Mary chose you for this special task to be educated within a community of faith and scholarship. And I think that's so powerful. So I believe each one of our students are chosen, okay, by Our Lady. And I also believe each one of us who are here working at the college are also chosen. So now, when I, I interview everybody that's hired on campus, and when I interview them before they they come in for the interview, I look at their resume or their CV, and I say their name out loud, and I pray a Hail Mary for them, okay? And then every year at the beginning of school, I take out the directory, and I pray for each of our employees by name, because I really believe that the, the, that the people that work here, that teach here, that form our students are also chosen by our lady. So it, it's just a, 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 like a, uh, you know, kind of a big picture thing about embracing our mother. It's so important. Well, yeah, that seems that, you know, that devotion to Our Lady is such a key aspect. You know, I, as you look at the across the United States, there are several longstanding Catholic institutions that are starting to lose their, their Catholic identity and starting to fall into some of the, the woke politics and things like that. Uh, it seems that to me that Our Lady has, has protected this school and kept it orthodox, kept it solid with the magisterium, and has become one of the leading Catholic colleges in the United States. Well, you're nice to say that, but I agree uh, 100%. We... It is really important. And the, the document that really formed us uh, originally was Ex Gordi Ecclesiae. That was, a, uh, that was penned by St. John Paul II, okay, when he was the Pope in, in 1991. And it's, it's really interesting when you look at our history, it's really uh, an interesting concept of embracing what the church has asked us to do, okay? So 
In the late 1960s, early 1970s, a group of Catholic administrators came up with the, what was called the Land of Lakes document. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and generally, uh, I, I would I would generically say it was a document in which there was this belief that in order to get respect in the academy, okay, that that in essence Catholic schools had to put their faith on the shelf here mm -hmm. and and go all in on academic excellence, okay? And so that became a kind of a blueprint for Catholic education, all right, Catholic higher education. We followed that blueprint. And our enrollment went from one of the highest at the time to one of the lowest, and mm. went down and down and down until 1991, we had 570 students at Benedictine College. This just so happened, this is the year that Excorde Ecclesiae was penned by St. John Paul II and issued, and now, you had a new blueprint. And, and ex Gordy Ecclesiae basically said, look it, not only can you be faithfully Catholic and academically excellent, being faithfully Catholic actually means that you have to be academically <laughs> exactly. excellent. Okay, so now you had a new blueprint and schools can make a decision. Mm -hmm. Do you want to follow the blueprint created by uh, higher education administrators or did you want to follow a blueprint that was issued by the Pope. Hmm. We chose to fo follow the Pope's blueprint. And from that moment, we went 570 students and we continued to grow and we'll be over 2,200 uh, full-time undergraduates now. Wow. And so, because it works yep. and we wanted to follow the Pope and do what the church has asked us to do, you know. Um, one of the norms set by the bishops after Ex Gordi was sent out, uh, one of my favorite stories is one of the norms was uh, that uh, that a mandatum should be signed by, you know, theology professors. So, so the, the norm said, look, at, if you are a theology professor teaching the tenets of the faith in a Catholic university, in a theology department, then you ought to be teaching those tenets of the faith consistent with the church's teachings. Mm -hmm. We kind of put this in the duh category, okay, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you know, this seems pretty normal, right? Sure. But there are a lot of folks that, will not sign the mandatum or want, you know, they, they sure. believe in, they, uh, some professors will say, this violates my academic freedom sure. to sign a mandatum. And um, we just don't buy that. And so we uh, ask, uh, in fact, in our applications for theology professors, philosophy professors, we want enthusiastic support of the mandatum, okay? Mm -hmm. um, or we, we just don't want, uh, uh, them informing our students. And so that's just one little idea sure. that that's out there that uh, I think has really moved us along. But I, I don't think in the end, your question, um, I don't think there's any question that it's been Our Lady that has really uh, made uh, made us great. And this, this embracing our mother, consecrating the college to her has been just fantastic. But there's also a second reason for our success, and that is that we've also embraced our mission, mm -hmm. okay? And that the mission informs uh, much of what we do as well, okay? In fact, we will have cabinet meetings, and in our cabinet meetings, the last question we'll ask ourselves is, is this decision consistent with our mission? Mm -hmm. If it's not, we won't do it. If it is, we'll move forward, okay? And so um, our mission and we always talk about our mission in pictures. It's always just easier for me sure, to explain. Yeah. <laughs> We've got these, the, uh, we have these four pillars to our mission. It's really our foundation, okay? Uh, we're a Catholic college, a Benedictine college, a liberal arts college, and a residential college. Catholic, Benedictine, liberal arts, residential. That's our foundation. That's our four pillars that supports our mission to educate our students within a community of faith and scholarship. Mm -hmm. So this integration of community and faith and scholarship and everything that we do, critical to our success, unique in the marketplace, and most importantly, it's the best way to educate young people. Absolutely. Yeah, and part of what has come out of the, the dreaming and the, the planning of, of Cabinet and the board and yourself um, is this new strategic plan uh, called Transforming Culture in America. Right. Maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, right. the, the big vision there. Well, that's, that's really interesting. So we like any school, for 165 years, we've had strategic plans that really, uh, I would probably say, looked 
inwardly said, okay, well, what, what can we do to make us better? In fact, our last strategic plan, you know, I had a vision to build one of the great Catholic colleges in America. And then as that strategic plan began to end, it was going to end in 2020. So in 2018, two years ahead of time, we started having meetings and asking people, okay, we think it's time for us to start asking, what kind of a force for good can we be? Mm -hmm. Can Benedictine College be? And yes, we want to build one of the great Catholic colleges in America, but why? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we started asking this question and it became clear. We brought experts in from all over the country and they sat down and we were in these meetings and it became pretty clear that what most people are concerned about is the culture. I mean, it is cold. this culture today brings about loneliness and hopelessness and faithlessness and truthlessness. And it was the concern for the culture that brought about that. And it became clear. What can we do? Well, what we can do is, is create an institution that can form young people, that can inform others to transform culture in America. OK. And and that that transformation will happen really through our mission. We've had the answer all along, the answer of community, faith, and scholarship. In a world of loneliness and polarization, community is the answer. Mm -hmm. You hear that we're in an age of hopelessness and incivility. Mm -hmm. Well, faith is the key. And we're in a no-truth era. We're, we're kind of information rich, but analysis poor. Mm -hmm. Well, scholarship's the foundation. So if we can form our young people in community, faith, and scholarship, and send them out to their communities, into their parishes, to their workplaces, they can truly transform culture in America. And, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's, it's, I love that there's this underpinning of evangelization that goes involved in that, right. of no matter if you're going into business or medicine or athletics or whatever it might be, we want you to be leaders that, that image that exact thing of community, right. faith, and scholarship. And doing it in the secular world. Like, don't be afraid to go out and be a great lawyer. Don't be afraid to go out and take what you've formed here and go out, which goes right back to the Benedictine tradition, right? Going right, right. all the way back yeah. to St. Benedict himself of right. come here, let me form you in the best, and then go back out and right. go show the world. Uh, that's exactly right. In <laughs> fact, sometimes I'll, I will get questions when we tell, tell folks about our vision to transform culture in America. Uh, really? You're a school of, you know, 2200 in, in Atchison, Kansas. And I'll remind everybody, look at the, the Benedictines literally saved Western civilization. I mean, they, they transformed Western civilization uh, in, in Europe and during the Dark Ages. And you know what? St. Benedict never had more than 200 monks at Monte Cassino. From Monte Cassino, those 200 monks, he sent them throughout Europe and to transform the culture. So it can be done and it will be done and it has to be done because we're in an era in this country where the culture needs to be transformed. We need to embrace community. We need to embrace faith. We need to embrace scholarship. Yeah, and one of the things that even though the first time I visited that, that feeling of hope I see it in every student yeah. here. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I and mean, it's just in the lifeblood uh, here. And I, I, I love to see that because, yeah. as you said, I mean, go out into the secular world, there's a lot of hopelessness. There's a lot of kind of drabness, if you will, to, so send, to send hope-filled students and leaders out into the real world. I mean, that just yeah. is exactly what our culture needs. Oh, my gosh. If anybody's listening, if they ever want to visit and see the most joyful, happy, <laughs> unbelievable young people uh, and that will give them hope come to Benedictine College because we get the best students in the entire world and they're here and they really take seriously this notion, this uh, idea to transform the culture. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, now I want to switch gears just a little bit and yep. hear more about yourself. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. So let's hear a little bit about your, your story, how you came to Benedictine, how you ended up as the president, yeah. um, and maybe a little bit of your faith journey uh, along the way sure. as well. So I, I grew up in St. Joe, Missouri, uh, St. Joseph, not very far from here. I taught by the Benedictine sisters when I was in uh, high school. I, um, I was coached by Benedictine alums. OK, I, I was, went to a small school. I, I want to say I was coached like I'm some star athlete. In fact, I always tell the story, although I am a two time Hall of Famer. I don't know if you knew that or not, Jared. I'm, I, I'm, I've been inducted uh, twice into our athletic <laughs> Hall of Fame at the high school. My sophomore year, I sat the bench when our football team went undefeated and was number one in the state. So they inducted the entire team into the Hall of Fame, okay, <laughs> including, so I was gonna go whether I did anything or not. And then my junior year, I sat the bench when our 
uh, our high school basketball team won the state title. Okay. So they inducted the entire team into things. So I didn't do anything to deserve to be a Hall of Famer. I just happened to suit out and yeah. watch other really talented people, you know, sure. do great things. <laughs> but it hasn't really stopped me from uh, telling my the kids, uh, my kids, hey, look, at you live with a two-time <laughs> Hall of Famer. Exactly. But anyway, so uh, I went to uh, LeBlanc High School, taught by the Benedictine sisters. I came over to uh, Benedictine, graduated here. I met my wife here, Amy. Uh, I graduated in 82. She graduated in 84. I then went to Washburn Law School in Topeka, okay, and became an attorney. Uh, uh, then we got married and we moved to Kansas City. I was an assistant district attorney, so I tried a lot of jury trials as a prosecutor. I then uh, went to uh, private practice for a short period of time. Then I worked for Sprint Corporation, which is now T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. I worked for them for 14 years. But the last 12 of those 14, I was on the board of directors of the college, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot about the college and my predecessor uh, decided to leave. So I went to the chair and I said, uh, you know, look, at I don't have any experience for this job. You guys would be idiots to hire me. And they did. And that was 19 years ago. <laughs> and they, I, they probably haven't figured me out yet. So that's my path to the presidency, which is a pretty unusual path to the presidency, sure. uh, you know. But we've been really blessed. And we moved up here. And the, our, our three kids have, have just really, it's been a, just a great experience for them. Great experience for my wife and I. And, and being around these young people, I'm not kidding, has made us better, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, uh, we have our adoration time on Monday nights. We used to have it on Friday night at 11 o'clock. And I mean, it was like Grand Central Station uh, in this adoration chapel. You could not find a seat on 11 o'clock on a Friday night. I was saying to myself, oh my gosh, don't these kids have something, you know, to be doing? But no, they're coming to adoration. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing place. That's awesome. Yeah. H had you always been interested in law? Is that, was that kind of your path you had chosen early on? Y yeah. And uh, we, we always say this, re sociological studies always will tell you that three things happen to young people in college. Mm -hmm. Okay. You develop lifelong relationships. You make the faith your own. And the third thing that happens to you is you discover your vocation, okay? Mm -hmm. And so while I was here, uh, I was very involved in uh, political science. That was my major in history. And so I was kind of drawn to the law, right? Yeah, so that's yeah. what became a attorney. Well, now you've been full leader here now for 19 years, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Um, I would love to hear some of the leaders of history or, or figures that you tend to look towards. I know you're a history buff sure. uh, yeah. as well. So who are some of the other men or women that really inspire you and your leadership that you try to emulate uh, their lives? Sure. So there's I, I probably a couple categories. One is there's religious leaders. Uh, I think St. Maximilian Kolbe is really an amazing person. Most er, most everybody knows about uh, him giving up his life in mm -hmm. the uh, in the concentration camp. But but before that, he was an amazing amazing man going over to Japan and starting a mission there. And and uh, you know he had was publishing this uh, Immaculata newsletter that a million people were reading. It was an amazing thing. So uh, he's really inspiring. John Paul II is inspiring. Also, you know, I'm a huge fan of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Eisenhower, I think, is pretty amazing. Uh, you know, won the war and, uh, you know, one of the best peacetime presidents we'd ever had, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, Ronald Reagan's a, I'm a fan of Ronald Reagan, not, not because, because he had this vision, right? Two visions, right? Get the economy going in communism, boom, boom, right? Uh -huh. You know, so I, I appreciate people who have vision like that. And so those are probably, I, I think that we owe a debt of gratitude to Winston Churchill uh -huh. when everyone was against him. Everybody, everybody in England, everybody around the world was against him. And he stood his ground because he knew what was right and saved Western civilization. So those are some of the folks that, that, that I've. What I love about that list is you've got this great list of, of heroic figures that were martyrs, uh, but then also every one of them to me exude this gentlemanliness, right? And, right? and when I think of John Henry Newman's idea of a university, one of the things that he wanted to form, he was dealing with a, a men's university, was gentlemen, right? People right. who had character, who, who, who presented what the school was about out into the real world. Uh, and, and to what we were talking about earlier with the college, it, it seems that that is just infused into it as well. Right. And, and one of the things I, I 
love that you offer here is a leadership class, actually. So you, right. you bring in these great figures to, to teach the students, to form the students how to be those gentlemen and gentlemen, women uh, leaders out in the real world. Tell us a little bit more about, about that class. Oh, it's just a fantastic class. Actually, it came out of a necessity in a way. I would go to these really incredible places and meet people, and I'd always ask them, I'd say, hey, why don't you come and speak at our school? And there's a lot of people that would love to speak to college students. And sure. then I get back to my office. I say, well, guys, should I have them on Tuesday night or Wednesday night? Or is anybody going to show up? So I decided, well, I don't have this class and we'll meet every Monday at four o'clock. And so now I have an automatic place and we've been really blessed. So I've just started asking anybody that I run into that I think that would lead, uh, help our students along. We've had cardinals we've had bishops secret service agents medal of honor recipients you know the owner of the of the chicago bears the owner of the kansas city chiefs the general manager of the kansas city royals former ceos current ceos it it's been a really a, a, an incredible opportunity incredible opportunity for um our students uh, a lot of our students have found jobs uh, from these but more importantly they're getting incredible wisdom okay mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. You know, we have like really amazing students and sometimes our students will say to themselves, I don't know if I can serve the church unless I'm a missionary or I become a priest. And so I wanted them to see that God gives everybody different talents. Mm -hmm. And some sometimes God gives you a talent to be a neurosurgeon, some to be a lawyer or a teacher or, you know, or different business person in that you can serve the church with those talents. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a priest. You don't have to be a missionary to serve the church. And so that's the type of people I want to come and influence our, our students. So almost every one of them has that we've asked has uh, some sort of a, a religious foundation or mm -hmm. faith-filled foundation. So then they can tell our students, uh, yes, I, I'm successful here, but it doesn't work for me. It, uh, uh, we had Harrison Butker, the kicker of the Kansas City Chiefs. And he summed it up really great for our students. And I thought it was really profound. He said, look, it, it's faith, family, and football. Mm. And he says, uh, if I'm not performing well in football, it's because my faith and my family aren't, aren't in sync here. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, um, and so if I start putting football above number one and number two, then I'm not going to be successful in football. So I know I have to be successful in faith and with my family, and then football is going to come. Mm -hmm. So it was really fascinating. And that's kind of the message that our students are getting to. And I think that's really powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to see these, these men and women who across all walks of life, just exude excellence and mm -hmm. exude character. That, that to me is, it just inspires students to do that in, in the real world, you know? Right. Um, and one of the things I love, especially the idea of, of leadership principles being formed and, and taught, no matter what role you go into, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or you're whatever it might be, you are a leader, right? You, right. you are a figure that, that exudes something, some kind of truth about, ultimately for us as Catholics, right? That right. you're exuding what it means to be a good, character-filled uh, Catholic. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of the um, sort of attributes of some of those leaders you mentioned? Um, you know, you mentioned like strength and things like that, but yeah. um, you know, what, what would you like to say, like uh, Winston Churchill, this is really what he was about and uh, Abraham yeah. Lincoln, you know, sure. what are some of those character traits that really right. you, you kind of love, grab onto? You know, before I answer that question, I wanted to tell you something that I tell our students all the time, what I think is really important because you talked about leadership and how important it is to form leaders today. Mm -hmm. So in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, uh, when we were about 100 years old at college, uh, for every two people that received a college degree, one person retired. So basically what that meant was the, the workforce is being doubled every year by college graduates. Mm -hmm. But today, because uh, the baby boomers are retiring, the aging of America, uh, now for every one person that receives a college degree, two people retire. Mm. So what I tell our students is that your generation, you are going to be asked to take on leadership roles in organizations faster than any generation in, in our history. Our country needs them to be prepared to take on those leadership roles. We take that pretty seriously. That's why we have this leadership class. That's why we have our student life program is geared to developing America's next leaders because mm -hmm. We need to develop those leaders because America needs them, okay? So, 
you know, when I look at these leaders that I've studied and things, three things probably come about most of anything, right? Character, competence, and a commitment to greatness, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, in order to be a great leader, you need those three things. Number one, character. If you don't have character, I mean, it's more than just being honest or telling the truth. I mean, it's, it's a bigger picture. Are you willing to make hard decisions because they're the right decisions, okay? Mm -hmm. And having good character and, 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 uh, is really important. People will not follow you if they do not trust you, okay? Mm -hmm. It just won't happen. So character is, is, is key. Competence is really important uh, because people may follow you for a while if uh, they believe that you're, they have great character. But if you're not competent in your field or willing to become competent in your mm -hmm. field, right, uh, they won't follow you. Uh, uh, success only comes before work in the dictionary, right? You have to be willing to put in the time and put in the work to be successful and to become competent in your field. And finally, people will follow you if they trust you. People will follow you if they know if if they think that you know what you're doing. But they'll follow you forever if you will take them to places they never thought they were going to go. Mm -hmm. And if you have this commitment to greatness, this vision for greatness, uh, they will follow you, um, you know, uh, forever uh, as long as you still have character and competence because. People want to be a part of something greater than than themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you can create and you, if you can create those three things, then people will follow you. All those folks I talked about, they had those three things: high character, great competence, and this vision, this uh, this commitment to greatness. That's terrific. Yeah, and then you wrap that in with all of the holiness that's desired here as well, and well, form and sure. holiness. You know, right. it just creates these leaders that are that are ultimately saints, right? That is exactly what our culture needs. That's exactly. Um, right. And one thing that you see as well in, in the plan, but then also in some of the, the heroes you've mentioned is this love of America, right? Um, and there's obviously in the the uh, cultural milieu, a anti-Americanism that's right. happening right now. But then even in some Christian Catholic cultures, there's a little bit of a anti-Americanism. But sure. uh, even looking at the, the new library, which I'd love for you to Talk a little yeah, bit about sure. as well. We've got the the um, uh, replica of Independence Hall, of clearly a statement that we love this country. Right. Um, you know how? Where does that come from? Um, obviously, it's a, a big passion of yours. Sure. Um, but then, you know how how do we want to keep moving that forward? Right. Well, America is the greatest country ever created. Right. You know, and uh, we we really believe. I mean, almost kind of what you commented. On, we believe that around the country. Universities, for some reason, have lost their way. They, they teach anti-American history. And we wanted to put a flag in the ground and say, we love our country. We believe the last best hope on earth should be celebrated. And those ideals of self-government, uh, civic virtue, constitutionalism uh, uh, should be preserved and uh, passed on to the next generation. I mean, Ronald Reagan said, listen, if you don't pass on you know, the ideals of our founders to the next generation, you'll lose them, right? You know, mm -hmm. and so we have to, to do that. And, and this was a visual way for us to do it. Our new library, which uh, will, you know, 90% of it will be just like a regular library, but, but we wanted to fashion it after Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And inside is a replica of the assembly room. This is the room where they, you know, debated the declaration, they wrote the constitution, and it's a place now where not only can we teach our young people, the, the ones that go to Benedictine, about the greatness of this country and the ideals of the founders, but it becomes a place in the region where we can bring young people, grade mm -hmm. schoolers and high schoolers, onto our campus. We can have them do mock constitutional conventions and do debates, and now they can learn about the specialness and the exceptionality of this great country of ours. And we think it's really important. Now's the time. We have to capture the culture and we have to capture this kind of notion that's starting to creep in that America is just not good enough and that, that uh, what came about in 1776 and, and in the Constitution is not good enough, okay? It is, and we need to preserve that. We need to preserve those ideals. That's terrific, especially the underpinning of all of those four pillars you mentioned of the Benedictine tradition, the liberal arts, everything that goes into really understanding what makes that right. so noble and, and so great that right. inspired the country to become what it is, yeah. right? And, and one of the things that we can do that, that others can't do is that we can also tell the tale 
of the um, the impact that the Catholic intellectual tradition had on the founding. Yes. You know, not not many people know this, but you know, of course, uh, Saint Robert Bellarmine, you know, wrote about. Um, uh, against the divine right of kings and wrote about that freedom comes from God uh, and human freedom comes from God. That notion written by St. Robert Bellarmine, picked up by John Locke, okay, uh, didn't give Bellarmine credit because he didn't want to give credit to sure. a papist, right? Okay. <laughs> sure. And then that, both of those notions were picked up by Thomas Jefferson and put in the Declaration of Independence. So the Catholic intellectual tradition lives and breathes within the Declaration and lives and breathes within the Constitution. And that's a story that we can tell mm -hmm. at Benedictine College, and it's a, an important story to tell. It's such a, a beautiful sort of holistic understanding of, of being a patriot, being a Catholic, you know, all the roles that we play as human beings. Uh, and then that idea of holism, one of the things too that I love about this school when I first again came here, mm -hmm. Um, is the, the love of athletics, that there right. is a love of sports and the, the, the characteristics that it teaches and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, maybe say a little bit about why we love athletics here and why we, we celebrate that so much. Right. I think, uh, you know, I think peop some people get caught up in the commercialization of athletics mm -hmm. and are saying, oh my gosh, has it gotten too big? Has it taken over certain things? But its foundation is really important. Teamwork, sacrifice, uh, giving yourself of others. Uh, I, I tell the athletes every year, I say, You're, you have probably never felt better than when you were on the field of play and you noticed all of your teammates and you were doing, sacrificing yourself for the betterment of the goal. And, and that's when you probably were most alive when your team was working together as a team for the betterment of the whole. Uh, that's pretty powerful, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and when we're here with an, a mission to educate within a community of faith and scholarship, anything that we can do to, to show our young people how community is built is gonna be really, really powerful. And that's what uh, that's what can happen. And even in those sports where you think that are individual sports, mm -hmm. you, uh, our our closest team probably is our cross country team. Mm. I mean, they cheer for each other. They want everybody to do well. And if if they're running hard and one of their teammates beats them, they're just as happy for them as if they would have won themselves. It, it's it's incredible because they understand that if they work together everybody's gonna get better. Yes. And that's also, if we're gonna talk about transforming culture in America, I mean, sports are just in the lifeblood of American culture. It that's just right, is. that's right. And so if we can send out, you know, even though I'm sure a lot of the athletes will become businessmen and other leaders in other areas, but a lot of coaches, we need a lot oh of gosh. that in this, in this culture. Uh, I was highly affected by, cult, uh, by coaches in both positive sure. and negative ways. So to send out coaches that are formed in the great Catholic intellectual tradition and how to lead other, other students, yeah. and gosh, that's a beautiful way to, to hit the culture in such a big way. Yeah, and, and we probably take a different approach that, than other athletic departments take. We, we believe uh, our, our, our vision for athletics is to win within the mission, mm. win within the mission. And I tell them all the time, I, I say, look at it. If we win a national championship with a bunch of knuckleheads, okay, that aren't going to class and they're not going to Bible studies and they're not, you know, impact on the faith, uh, we're not even going to put the banner up, mm. okay? Uh, on the other hand, if we have a bunch of choir boys, okay, and we're not winning any games, well, then we're not committed to excellence either in yes. this field that we've chosen. So winning within the mission is this incredible balance, but that's what we're going for, and that's really important. And that mission is building community, you know, having a strong faith life, and uh, being strong academically. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about, so. Yeah. And then one more kind of aspect of the, of the school as yeah. well is the devotion to, to STEM um, uh, topics and uh, subjects. Um, and of course, a big one that we've got, of course, is the, the signing of the agreement for the new medical school that's, right. that's on its way. Yeah. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about what, what, where does that desire for really a focus on STEM uh, sure. come from? Well, first off, um, it's really important to know that science and faith you know, live together, mm -hmm. right? Okay, faith and reason is uh, like two wings on a, on a bird to reach mm -hmm. for greatness, mm -hmm. as John Paul II, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but, but um, so, and in fact, walking into our science building 
is a raven, which is our mascot, with that quote from John Paul II. Because we wanted everybody to understand that when you walk into a science building on our campus, that we believe that faith and reason, that science and, um, and faith work together and they're not separated. You don't have to check your faith at the door when you walk into a science building at Benedictine College, and that's really, really important. And so it goes, it, it's a natural progression for us that when we were approached by Catholic Healthcare International to sign a, an affiliation agreement to bring the St. Padre Pio Medical School to Benedictine College's campus, that we were eager to sign that because that's just a natural progression mm -hmm. for our students. But the uniqueness of this proposed medical school is that it will be a faithful Catholic medical school at a time when healthcare needs uh, faithful Catholic doctors. And that's, uh, we, you know, it matches right in with our vision. Uh, you wanna transform culture? You wanna transform health, the culture in healthcare? <laughs> Have faithful Catholic doctors, and they'll change the culture. You yes, know, it's yes. going to be really important. Yeah, I have numerous uh, friends that are in the medical fields, and they talk about the the danger of the dehumanization actually that happens. That when you look at a person, you're largely looking at what you're trying to cure. So it ends up becoming you are largely the disease that we're talking about, not the fullness of the human person. You know, thinking right. about other aspects of your life that might be affecting whatever the disease might be. Right. Uh, but to take the disease just as seriously, but then also as a Catholic doctor to think about every other aspect of how's your faith life, how is you know your prayer life things that are going on in your life, um, obviously with the best medical treatment uh, that, that's available. Right. Our doctors, I, I've, I'm, I've literally had, oh, I don't know, probably 10 letters from nurses, mm -hmm. you know, that graduated from Benedictine College. And in every one of the letters, which were basically, thank you, you know, for creating a great school and having a great nursing program. Invariably, in every one of those letters, there'll be a paragraph about how it was Benedictine College that that allowed them to be a better nurse because they see Christ in every patient that they, they, that they serve. Uh, uh, it's pretty Doesn't cool. Doesn't get better than that. <laughs> no, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so as we mentioned at the, the beginning of uh, this conversation, you know, we, we have students coming in the next couple of weeks. Right. And um, I wanted to just give you maybe a minute or two to, you know, what advice would you offer sure. uh, to the students that are coming? And um, how would you like to kind of inspire them for this upcoming yeah. semester? Well, that's, that's great. So what I tell them all the time is, uh, okay, when you come to Benedictine, we're going to ask you to live the mission okay, while you're here, of community, faith, and scholarship. But we say, look, you're not doing this for me. You're not doing this for us. We want you to live the mission while you're here because more importantly, we want you to live the mission after you leave. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you graduate, we want you to understand the power of community, that the whole is stronger than its individual parts. Okay, humans are social beings, okay? We, we need each other to be fully alive. Uh, I pro anybody watching this or listening to this knows that, after the pandemic, uh, you know, what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Society told us what? Uh, you can't build community. You can't have friends. Uh, you can't, you have to wear a mask all the time. You can't even get within six feet of people, okay? And, and we missed something mm -hmm. during that period of time. And we're now just seeing the ramifications mm -hmm. of those isolation uh, tactics. And and uh, you see see what's happening because people want community. We'll teach them that, and so they, they can build communities after they leave. Secondly, when they leave uh, from a faith aspect, they'll have a close and personal relationship with Jesus Christ, understanding that true happiness comes from doing God's will. You know, I tell them all the time, humans have this innate desire to worship. Mm -hmm. We have an innate desire to worship. And if we don't worship what's true uh, or God, We'll end up worshiping other things. You see this in your own life. You see this in other people's lives. All of a sudden you start worshiping social media or uh, the internet or politics, uh, you know, popularity, et cetera, okay? And your mind is constantly on other things other than what's true and worshiping what's true. And it's like Jesus at the woman at, with the woman at the well, you know, oh yeah, you can drink water, but you know what? You're gonna be thirsty uh -huh. unless you, unless you, you know, um, believe in me, unless you follow me, unless you uh, worship God, uh, then that's the only way you won't be thirsty again. This is what we tell our students. And then finally on the scholarship side, uh, that when they leave, we want them to be lifelong learners, okay? And uh, through the foundation of the liberal arts, they, they'll be able to take all this information that they're getting every day, they're getting bombarded, okay? Be able to analyze it, make good decisions, and continually seek the truth. So community, faith, and scholarship, 
live that here while you're here, Benedictine, because you need to live that after you leave. And if you do, you'll transform culture in America. The last thing I tell them all the time too is, and I mentioned this earlier in the interview, is that we all want to be a part of something greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you all want to be a part of something. Okay. Well, Absolutely. okay, you come to Benedict and all of a sudden, you're part of a church that's 2,000 years old, an order, the Benedictine order is 1,500 years old, a, a country that's almost 250 years old, and a, and a college that's 160 years old, but more importantly, a college that has a vision unlike any other place in America, and that is to form you in community, faith, and scholarship so you can leave and you can transform culture in America. Uh, that's Now you're at a place that's bigger than yourself and you're part of that and you will be able to transform culture. Uh, that's pretty big. That's pretty big ask, but you know, <laughs> yeah. this is what we tell Very inspiring. Kids, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Always aim for excellence, right? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> well, President Menace, you're such a blessing and uh, thank okay. you so much for this conversation. It's really been wonderful. And uh, for everyone listening, be sure to listen to, the, to our future episodes and uh, be sure to share this around with your friends and family, especially those who might be Benedictine alums or you've got friends that might be interested in visiting our campus. Uh, be sure to share this around and, and let everybody know yeah. about it. So. I might ask you, uh, tell, the, tell the audience here, you know, after every student mass on our campus, our students, um, when, the, when the priest walks down, our students hit their knees and they pray uh, St. Michael the Archangel prayer for our country. They pray a memorari for the college, and then they ask St. Benedict and St. Scholastica to pray for vocations, okay? So uh, we have really embraced the memorari, and so if you don't mind, let's end let's with the memorari. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly into thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother, to thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the Benedictine Dialogues, a production of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. To catch all the latest and support our growing platform, visit media.benedictine.edu. And be sure to recommend this show to your friends and family. Help us to transform culture in America, one conversation at a time.